So um, many of you know that back in January of last year, we did what I call call to actions, because what I said to folks is that I can't do this work by myself. So there were a number of groups and organizations that came to the table, and they stay at the table on a regular basis, and they meet with me to talk about things that they're doing and then how we can enhance their efforts. And um, Rachel Monroe from the Weinberg Foundation actually sat in on a meeting and was really excited about the work that these folks are doing and said, how can I help? And so what she's done is provided a half million dollars in grants for the next two years to encourage these organizations to continue their work and to support them. Many of them don't look for funding. Some of them have just been doing it because they enjoy the work. And then some of them have been growing their organizations. And we want them to continue to grow and do their work. And let me just say, the Baltimore Brothers are among the folks that are here. Uh, Mr. Clayton, if you don't know Mr. Clayton, Mr. Clayton uh, operates out of the Wal Rose Street Community Center. You've heard me talk about him on occasions. Uh, he has about 40 some odd young people that he meets and takes them around East Baltimore and they help to clean up the city over there. And then Marvin McDowell of Umar Boxer, No Hooks Before Books, uh, runs a program off of North Avenue. He's been doing it for years. And then Monica Cooper, the Maryland Justice Project. These are just a few of the groups that work with us on a regular basis. And then uh, Rashid Aziz, the Citywide Youth Development Program. And then Ray Kelly, who's been engaged and active in our community for years, is here with us, uh, No Boundaries Coalition. And uh, Tiffany Ginyard, uh, Fly Girls Network, uh, working with young girls and trying to encourage them. And I also want to take a moment to thank Allie. Allie has been uh, working with this group. Uh, we've done listening tours. We've done walks throughout the community. Uh, we bring back resources to neighborhoods after our listening tours. Uh, we were all trained by the mediation group. You had to spend three hours doing that. I said, if the mayor can do it, everybody else can do it as well. <laughs> and so um, we walk neighborhoods and communities, and it's been really great to learn directly from communities what some of their needs are. Uh, expungement services are things that we brought back to the neighborhoods and communities, and they've been uh, helpful with that. So with that, I want to turn it over to Rachel first and say uh, thank you on behalf of all these groups and organizations. Thank you so much. We have a young man here who works with young entrepreneurs uh, everything from uh, the ice cream business, or what's not ice cream? Sorbet. Sorbet <laughs> business, too. Uh, actually working uh, with Under Armour, doing manufacturing and teaching uh, children how to make clothes and so forth. So really excited about the work that all of you all do, and we just want to enhance it. Rachel? Thank you. Thank you all very much for being here. I want to thank the mayor and Allie and the mayor's team for the support of this work, but more importantly, the people behind us and the other people that they represent who weren't able to be here today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Nakia Horton from the Weinberg Foundation offices who will share with you a few of the details. Good morning. So the Weinberg Foundation is very excited about this partnership with the mayor. It's through her leadership that we are involved in this initiative. And it gives the foundation an opportunity to reach organizations that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to reach. These are the smaller nonprofits that are on the ground and doing important work for the individuals of our city. So we're very excited about this grant. It's $500,000 over two years for organizations that, we, that are actually on the ground and doing the work. The foundation gives $100 million a year in grant making all over the world. And 40 per, close to 40% of that money is in Maryland and predominantly in Baltimore City. So this was just a great way for the foundation to reach out and to be able to help those organizations that are on the ground and running and working with those smaller grants and just helping them do what they do in our city to help make Baltimore a better place for all of us. Thank you. Could you spell your name, please? Sure, N-A-K-I-A, -A, last name H-O-R-T-O-N. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions for the group or anybody yeah, in the group? Why can't we normally reach these groups? Are they sort of too small for $500 million a year? Foundation? So the typical grant process at the Weinberg Foundation is uh, several months from a letter of inquiry to a full grant application to approval of a grant. And for the smaller nonprofits represented by the people behind us, they are doing incredible work in the community day in and day out. And it is too high of a burden of work for them to go through without deep staffs, without a development team, et cetera. So there will be minimum standards. You have to be a 501c3, you have to file your 990. There'll be certain standards that any nonprofit would have to meet, but it's a lower threshold for these organizations so that we can more quickly provide them with funds so that they can use those funds to make the meaningful difference they're making in the community. And 
this is not about us. This is really about their work and elevating their work. So another special what? So typically in a Weinberg Foundation grant process, you may submit a report to us that could be 50 pages long with evaluations, with criteria, with certifications, with outcomes over the past three years, with three years of budget, et cetera. So the details of what you have to submit, which you see in the brochures in front of you and also online on our website, is a much sort of shortened, abbreviated process with some basics, but not the full standard. In other words, if you're asking for a million dollar grant from the Weinberg Foundation, that's gonna take a longer time and we're gonna go through a very arduous process. For $10,000 a year for two years or $20,000 to one of these organizations, we should be able to do that due diligence more efficiently for them. And I, I think the other um, aspect of that is to help grow these organizations so that they can apply for larger grants. Yeah. And um, I mean, I think this is a step in the right direction to support them, more importantly, to grow them. Could we have one of the people sure. of the groups give us an example of what this money is going to provide for them? Anybody? Please. Sure. Go <laughs> I'll go next. <laughs> sure, Big brother first. Yeah. Well, I run the Uma Box and the Youth Development No Hooks Before Books. And the funds that we'll get, you know, we have a, a great educational component, which is the No Hooks Before Books. Uh, we have about an 85% uh, graduation rate, and them funds would really help us, you know, have the teachers and the lessons th that we need you know, to make the program stay and, and be better for the kids. And we also have the boxing program where we do a lot of traveling with the kids and we need uniforms and equipment and everything, and, and that money really would help us out, you know. And I thank the Weinbergs, you know, for coming we to thank you and helping us. It's we great. really need the help. Name? Yeah, could you tell us your name? My name is uh, Marvin McDowell. M-C-D-O-W-E-L? Yes, capital D. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Ray Kelly. I'm with the No Boundaries Coalition. So for five years now, we've had a summer program, the My Block, My Hood, where we clean vacant lots. And this is kind of allowing that initiative to connect need and opportunity. So now we'll be able to do more lots. We'll be able to pay residents in the area to either take a day off of work to help do community revitalization, and more importantly, bring opportunity to the many residents in West Baltimore that are seeking employment and that could use a little boost throughout the week. So we, we too are appreciative that our work, for one, has been recognized to the point in that the city, as well as Weinberg, is invested in growing our community so we can continue to kind of bring need and opportunity together in West Baltimore. Thank you. First, I want to thank the mayor and the Weinberg. The young people that we have, we have mainly a minimum of 40 on the weekends, uh, mainly Saturday, and they are referred to us by the guys on the corner, by their family members, by people that's incarcerated. And we try to give them the skills that they need so they will not end up in certain situations that will sh cut their future short. We want to strengthen their relationship with their parents, with their family, with the community, with the seniors, um, all across the board. And others might bring issues to us that we haven't evaluated that we say, hey, look, we need to take a serious look at it. If you're in school, you've been suspended, we want to know why, we want to look at your report card. We want to help you across the board as much as possible. And again, I'm thankful to the mayor and the city of Baltimore that we have an opportunity to continue this effort into the future. I would just add that it is a unique partnership for the Weinberg Foundation. We are working this program in partnership with the mayor, and it is her leadership that has made this happen. We know about this group of nonprofits because of her leadership and we were eager to be supportive of her work in this regard. So we see this as a meaningful way to be in many communities in Baltimore at the same time and to try to help nonprofits we may otherwise not come across. What is the city's role in all this? Well, I convened, well, when I, back in January, when I convened the group, you know, I um, said, you know, come to the table, help me, uh, let me know what you're doing, how I can enhance your work, 
and how we can be supportive of what you're doing. Um, with Mr. Clayton, for example, he works with the Be More Beautiful campaign. We've got jackets for the young people over there. So, you know, if they need brooms and things like that, we help them in that way. And so um, this will work through our Baltimore Community Foundation. Okay, all right. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Today we are releasing a report on the uh, Baltimore City's Food Environment, the 2018 report, and um, the new name for food deserts is Healthy Food Priorities Areas because there has been an evolving conversation both in Baltimore and nationally because deserts imply that there is no food uh, when it is actually there is an imbalance between healthy and unhealthy foods. And I wanted to thank, um, i trying to see who's here, um, Tom Stoser is not here. I see the health department is here. Our, um, our planning department is here as well. And the development, Baltimore Development Corporation, as well as Baltimore City Public Schools are also represented. And um, I'm going to turn this over to Holly, who's going to really uh, explain what we're doing here and why this is so important. And let me just say that um, this is something that we're really, really cons concerned about. I think Sheena Hamm, uh, who is the resident food um, equity advisor uh, to talk about how we are looking at this particular issue that our city faces. And it's important that you look at the map because it shows some of the uh, disparities that exist in our city and some of the issues that we're grappling with. Well, great. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. So I want to first start with a thank you to Johns Hopkins Center for the Global Future. We have co-issued this report together. Um, it's very important that we have the academic capital along with the policy application to make these maps um, and reports come true. I want to first start with, as you see with the healthy food priority areas, our numbers have gone down. Um, they were 25% and they're 23.5%. Um, what we know is that policy has started to make a difference. We have around 5,000 people that were impacted with a new personal property tax credit um, resulting in a new supermarket. So we did see a decline as a result of that. Another piece to know is that we changed the name and we changed it intentionally. Um, in the last administration, we had funding associated to the name and cities having maps to food deserts. Um, we always knew that there were pros and cons to the name. Um, so with the engagement of many community groups, our Food Policy Action Coalition, our resident equity advisors, we were guided to change the name to Healthy Food Priority Areas. Um, we want to show what our focus is on, not the liability, but what we're going to do about it. And that's why we have the Healthy Food Priority Areas. I also want to talk a little bit about collaboration. Um, government is one component to this. We have the Baltimore Food Policy Initiative, where intergovernmental collaboration between the Health Department, the Baltimore Development Corporation, Planning, Off Sustainability, and we work with many other agencies because food is everywhere and it intersects all agencies. Um, so we have to have a multi-agency approach to address the health and economic and environmental disparities in our city. But we also know that Food PAC, our Food Policy Action Coalition, has been growing. We have around 70 people representing nonprofits, residents, businesses, farmers, um, convening every other month to talk about policy barriers, opportunities, and networking. And the newest development, and I'm really excited to see the resident equity advisors here today, are the resident equity advisors. Um, we piloted it last year. And it is 16 resident equity advisors represented each of the 14 council districts with a few extras representing the healthy food priority areas. So that's 16. Uh, we have five here today. Um, and they have really been instrumental in fact checking and putting the lived experience to the policies and numbers that we see. Um, we also will be running our new um, group and cohort. And the applications will start next week. Um, so our current resident equity advisors will always be here with us, but we'll be bringing in a new class. And as any of those who want to come, come back will be coming for the <coughs> resident equity advisors as well. Um, with that, I would love to give the opportunity to Sheena Hamm, who's a resident equity advisor for the 7th District. Um, she is a PPO uh, president of her, of her son's school, and she's going to say a few words. Thank you, Sheena. Sheena. Hi. <clears throat> oh, I lost my voice. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I represent the 7th District. Uh, so basically, I was really excited when the resident food equity advisor opportunity came about. Uh, before then, I was just a regular resident trying to navigate throughout the city's resources to make sure that I was getting all the things that my household needed. 
and I was doing it the way that I had always done it. Before I had transportation, I would catch the bus to the supermarket, ask a friend for a ride, pay for a taxi. And then my household dynamic changed. Uh, our nutrition needs changed, dietary needs became more complicated. My family expanded. And so it became that I realized that it was really difficult to get the things that my household needed just living where I was living. So I'm in a priority area, formerly called the food deserts. And it wasn't so simple. And I really was becoming frustrated at why it wasn't easy enough to get the things that I needed. I felt like I shouldn't have to drag bags and bags of groceries on the bus. It wasn't fair. And then my neighbors around me, other relatives, they also needed the same things that my house needed. And so the elderly people, disabled people, they were depending on myself and other family members to, to help them out. And so it became a burden to just get groceries. And I was frustrated. I didn't know who was responsible. I felt like someone was responsible because I lived in a neighborhood, a residential neighborhood, and there were families here and no one was really doing anything about it, so I felt. And so a really good friend of mine came upon the planning uh, department's application for resident equity advisors. I read the description and I was like, oh, this is me. This is definitely what I need to do. It appeared to be a group of people who were in some type of place to make policy changes, somebody who could actually help us. And they wanted to hear from people who actually lived in it. There are always opportunities where you'll get some type of paper where people are asking, so what is it that this neighborhood needs? And everyone will, will fill it out, but you don't really feel like your voice has been heard. And with the the, the food pack and the resident equity advisor program, it was really a time where we felt like we were being heard. They were actually asking our opinions. They were like, what is it that you and your community needs? What changes would you like to see? How can we help? And we could actually see them doing the work after collaborating with us, and it was phenomenal. We actually, for once, or I actually for once, felt like someone who was a policymaker was doing something in my community to help all the people who were around me. And I was, I was ecstatic about it. It was really refreshing to see. And of course, nothing changes overnight, but now I understand the process of things. I understand that there will be more changes to come. I have seen you know, the, the benefit of their, of their work. Um, so I'm excited to see whatever whatever happens and what, what comes from it from, from now on. I'm glad there's going to be a second cycle. Hopefully I'm a part of it. If not, then I will be cheering for everyone. Um, so it's, I, I definitely hope that other residents can, can at least, you know, take a look at what it is that they're doing, whether it's through their social media or some other kind of literature. Definitely take a look at the, the new maps because they are a reflection of what everyone who are in these districts have come to <coughs> and told them about, so I'm excited. So, thank you. Thank you. Sheena, S-H-E-E-N-A-H? N-A, and ham with one M. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sheena, so much for your comments. Any questions for them? So why aren't there Giants or Trader Joe's or Whole Foods in the healthy food priority areas right now? So we have the personal property tax credits to attract more grocery stores into the city. Um, so Kristen Dawson with the Baltimore Development Corporation, that's one part of her full-time job is attraction and retention of supermarkets. So we have people on the ground trying to get the stores in where there's a high density of residents um, to be able to support a supermarket. So and the, property has been tax, the city's property tax rate may prevent... So it's a personal property tax credit, and this is really specific for supermarkets. So it's something you shake out the store, right, personal property. And when we interviewed the supermarkets several years ago prior to the policy change, that was one of their issues, was that the personal property tax credit was higher in Baltimore um, than in other areas <coughs> for supermarkets, and they really needed to see a shift and change. So we were able to change that policy to meet their needs. So that we have a, a property tax incentive for supermarkets specifically. Did they talk about that these are just not customers that are worthwhile? I mean, is that part of the problem? They don't see a market to open in Baltimore. So, so I, okay, go ahead. So one of the pieces is that we have 47 supermarkets in the city. 
um, and we did just get a new one in this past year after the pass of the personal property tax credit. Um, so we do have supermarkets in the city. We're trying to get more in the right places. It's also an opportunity that when we look at our, we have an eight point plan in the city of how do we address food access um, and healthy food priority areas. Supermarkets is one key piece, but that's one of the eight point plans. We need to be looking at the full retail experience. So it's looking at what is the shopping experience of a resident? Where do they shop? What's around them? So we have over 700 corner and convenience stores. We want to continue to support these stores to get healthy food availability in those stores. We want to make sure that kids are getting their meals um, after school. Um, and we have our food pantries. We have our urban farms. And we really want to make sure that we focus in on the full environment um, and also look at how do we support the corner and convenience stores and other retailers on supply chain so we can really see healthy food everywhere. Um, there's one other piece I wanted to mention is what's new in, these, in this report in addition um, is that we have new briefing books. Um, so we have 14 council district briefs, they're all on our website, Department of Planning, Baltimore Food Policy Initiative, and we'll be meeting with each council member to brief them on their food environment. And the new component is that we also have created um, briefing books for each of the six um, legislative districts for Baltimore, and that is brand new, so that we are really seeing policy makers being briefed and understand their food environment so we can look at policies from many angles. So why is it over the years that supermarkets have but it's not, I mean, this is not just Baltimore. This is an urban uh, problem that we've had. And in fact, uh, you'll hear those conversations. I know I'll hear them at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Everybody's looking at creating incentives to attract uh, supermarkets back to cities. At one time, they were in cities, and then they moved to surrounding uh, counties, and now they're moving back to cities. And so creating those tax credits to get them here is really important. So it's not just a Baltimore problem. This is an urban problem around the nation. Are the numbers of the people who, I'm not, I can't use this term, but the food desert areas, that like, are the 70% of households that have vehicles, do you consider that they do have access to good food? Because you can drive to a right. supermarket. For many, right? So what you're looking at is a little chart that has the four key factors. So we have four key factors that are used um, in our map. And we also have Caitlin from the Center for Liberal Future who can ask and answer any questions related to the factors and methodology. You want to step forward? Sure, yeah. So with the um, healthy food priority areas, we define it using four factors related to healthy food access. So we look at income, and then you also mentioned the vehicle availability. So there's an average across the city of 30% um, of households do not have access to a vehicle. So we use that as our threshold um, for this analysis. So in a given area, if there are 30% or more households that do not have access to a vehicle, then that will qualify as one of the factors for the healthy food priority area. And then the other two factors were the um, super market, distance to a supermarket, as well as the unique piece, which is the healthy food um, availability across all retail stores to really try to emphasize the point that there are multiple points of access um, um, for food aside from supermarkets. But so this 146,000, uh, some of those people will have a car and can drive okay. supermarkets. So that number, so what we do is we take those four factors and where those four overlap in a geographic area. So it has to be all four factors to be considered a healthy food priority area. So what you're looking at, the 146,000 people, which is 23%, those are the people who live in healthy food priority areas. But, so, so it's the latest, but what he's saying, but there's some that have cars, so they do have access. Still have access right. to quality. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do we know how many, what proportion? For vehicles? Well, just generally, of, of that 146,000, like how many of those people do you Actually think have are really like, I just can't get to good right. quality, affordable food? Right, so that's kind of a, an, a piece of this being a geographic analysis, is that we do look at area, uh -huh. and so we're using the assumption that the uh, households within a given area meet a certain threshold, and that all of those people then qualify for this for this determination. So that's one of the limitations of this analysis, where we're, we're looking at more of a geographic area-based analysis, rather than drilling down to the individual residents themselves. Okay. All right, I, I wanted to take a moment to say to Holly, thank you. Um, we just changed the policy that had been in place for some time now, and that was that we didn't activate uh, feeding children when schools were closed until they were closed for three days, and we changed that policy to every time a school closes, 
uh, that we will open up our rec centers. I know we got off to a stumbling start initially, um, but we're able to do that, and that now happens on a regular basis. Thank you. So, Madam Mayor, I know last year, for example, you were in Las Vegas for the retail expo. Yes. So when you're talking to grocery store Absolutely. companies and you ask them, why, why aren't you in these areas, what do they say to you? Well, we've been able to attract additional supermarkets to our area as a result of those kinds of visits. We have some supermarkets now uh, still continuing to look at Baltimore. I think the density of the population has a, a big issue. Um, income has another, uh, is another factor. Uh, but what we're finding is that because uh, supermarkets and retail, as you well know, is changing their footprint in terms of how they're operating in, in cities. And you'll see uh, Whole Foods is probably one of the few supermarkets that's expanding uh, in uh, downtown Baltimore, where most supermarkets are now looking for smaller, fr um, smaller footprints. You'll see it all across the country, whether it is you know, Target or uh, um, Kmart, Walmart, all of them are looking at small prints. You look at what's happening with Sears just down in Anne Arundel County where we saw Neiman Marcus last call close. Everybody is, is redefining. I think Amazon is helping folks to redefine what retail will ultimately look like. Will the target at Mondome and more close, closing have an effect on this? Will that create a new one of these areas, do you think? Well, I th well we have a supermarket on the other side. Uh, no. Not in, too, not in terms of food desert. And what was the new supermarket that's opened in that? Which one? The, the we have one we one have one. Um, what's the latest lot. supermarket? Save a lot. Save a lot. Mm -hmm. Where's that located? My mom runs right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Monument Street. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank okay. you again. Holly, I'm sorry. Can you, can you, what's your last name? Please? Freistadt. Can you spell that? F R. <laughs> E I S H T A T, Food Policy Director. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. This is my folder. I'll put your folder. So I do apologize. Thank you, Madam Thank you. So I've got a few minutes. I've got to, um, I'm doing a tour this morning. Uh, a ride along, I think it is. Mayor, we, um, we attended the governor's budget priorities um, yesterday, and the issue of crime came up, and he said he was putting the majority of his money into, into, into law enforcement and police. And when I asked him, um, do you agree with that priority? Of the I haven't seen the budget. I need, to sit, I need to see the budget, because one of the things I did ask him for mm -hmm. were additional officers, so that is a top priority for us. And so I know there's $9 million in the budget for that as well. So, uh, and then when you talk about what we've asked them for in terms of predictive analysis and policing and the new initiative that we're bringing on board with Sean Malinkowski, all of that is working directly with the police department. I think it's about $35 million that we've asked them for. Yeah, you asked him for money for, uh, for, instance, for, Oka, for, for Oka the mm -hmm. program. Has he responded to that? Uh, he liked all of the programs when I met with him. So he's going to pay for it? I, I don't know. I, you know, I haven't seen yeah, the budget yet. There's some pushback from activists saying, why wouldn't that money go to other organizations that are already existing? What do you say to that? What do you mean? I mean, people saying, like, this money is going to an organization that's from Boston. Well, first of all, um, I don't know if you know the woman who runs the program, yes, but she is local. Right. And um, everyone who will be hired in the program will be local. Safe Streets was not a local program either. Mm -hmm. We brought the model. It's a model of a program. Mm -hmm. So we're bringing the model here, but everyone who will be hired will be local. Madam Mayor, when it comes to Calverton, where are we at with getting the students back into the well, let me be real clear, you all. I don't run the schools, but I did make sure that there were alternatives for Calverton. And, um, you know, my first alternative that we were able to provide for them was uh, Kia. Um, they want to uh, fix up the school that they were going to move to. My understanding is that should be ready in a week or so. Uh, but Calverton has been open. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, I know with last week's Board of Estimates, um, a contract was approved for um, a consultant, um, Mr. Fleming, who will develop an operation for the city, oh, I'm sorry, I'm wrong one, I apologize, the <laughs> Tucker Group, which um, offers strategic consultation and tactical services for communications and the media. What do you, 
what exactly? So what they're doing is evaluating our, our current structure of communications and we're redesigning our communications office so that we can be in front of activities and things as it relates to the media. So I've asked them to come in, take a look at what we're doing. Um, if I could afford to hire them full time as my strategic communications director, I would. And wh wh why is this, I know it's being paid at uh, $240 an hour, $40,000, why is this a good use of taxpayers? Oh, I think it's a great use because oftentimes when we're trying to tell our story, it doesn't get out like it should. And uh, we're, we're getting inquiries all across the nation uh, in terms of some of the I issues and areas that I continue to speak on, whether it is homelessness or whether it is crime or whether it is housing. I'm getting uh, inquiries all around the world. So I'm always being asked to speak here, there, and everywhere, defining what is best for the city of Baltimore, how we communicate, I think is very important. Mayor, have you heard anything from um, the commissioner and any discussions about the detective suitor case or any developments in that? I actually raised that question yesterday with the uh, commissioner, and I've heard nothing. Um, so, uh, do, you, do, you, do you talk about, you, I know there was some talk about going to an outside <coughs> investigator, maybe state police. Has he mentioned anything about that to you, or do you have any indication? No, but I'll, we can have that discussion. You know, I want to sue the case solved, and it should be solved. You know, I do get a chance to talk to his wife from time to time, and she wants that case solved as well. And what do you think at this point? Do you have any sense of what might be going on? I mean, do you have any? I don't. Um, on the subject of homelessness, uh, the encampment on uh, Guilford is not clear. Can you talk about what's, why that's necessary? Uh, well, uh, Terry's here. I think you can have a conversation with Terry. But let me just say, you know, we have gone in and we have evaluated most of the folks there. Uh, we've gotten applications for them. You know, the key is to get po folks into safe housing. And no one should have to sleep on the streets of our city. And so our goal is to help them to get housing. And so I think we've pretty much completed many of the surveys uh, yeah, for them. And so, you know, we've gone in, we've talked to the individuals, and we want to make sure that we can get them the wraparound services and the things that they really need. And the previous clearing offered um, permanent housing. In this case, that has not happened. Also, we're going to well, I think there's a process. You know, when we did the. No, no, no. The process still remains the same. Even when we were working with the last group, some people were able to get housing right away, uh, especially um, those with women, uh, uh, women with children. We took care of them first. Uh, they went to places like Sarah's Hope and others. And um, you should know, too, that in many of these cases in conversations with these individuals, some of them aren't from Baltimore, and so we're trying to help them in that respect as well. You know, we have 100 people who are living at Helping Up Mission that are from Harford County, and we understand that because we have more services here probably than most of our surrounding jurisdictions. So we'll continue to work with everyone. The Squeegee Boy video. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of feedback that has been coming in on that. How often do you see kids out in the street and tell them to go to school? Uh, as many uh, as often as I can when I see someone standing on the streets of our city I want to know where they're going so this particular young person uh, that I'm very concerned about and have followed up with him uh, was um, I actually went to the school the next day and had a conversation with him um, and I asked his um, principal to get him signed up for youth works and so we got him signed up for youth works I encountered him again that same evening at 9.30 p.m., uh, sitting on the sidewalk at uh, Pennsylvania Avenue and right below Martin Luther King Boulevard. And um, he ran up to the truck, and I said to him, let me take you home. He gave me his address, but he said he didn't want to. His mother was down the street. And, um, and so I gave him something uh, to get some food because he was eating a little biscuit then. And then, um, I, uh, I think it was Martin Luther King, the next day, I encountered him standing at that same corner where I was headed up uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, turned back around, and uh, said to him that, you know, we really don't want you here on this corner. I asked him where his mother was. He ran up to me and gave me a hug. And um, uh, he said, she's right here. And so um, she, he said to her, this is the mayor. And she said, um, that's not the mayor. She said, this is the mayor. She came to school just for me. And um, so what I want you to know is that we've got some services for him. Uh, we are working with family services to provide meals for them on a regular basis. Uh, this is a very sad case uh, for this. I didn't know 
how, you know, I'm just telling the kid to go to school, you know, get off the corner. I did not know all of the predicaments that surrounded this particular individual. And so um, I, we're providing wraparound services for him. The problem with a 14-year-old on the corner is that what happens is they can get caught up in drug, drug addiction. They can get caught up, you know, these are targets for traffic, uh, trafficking. These are targets for drug dealers to get folks. You know, what he said to me was, I'm just trying to put a little money in my pocket. So um, I've also talked to the Office of Employment Development. We're probably going to put them on a stipend working. You know, we have a group of young people in Squeegee Corps that we work with on a regular basis, and some of them are on stipends as well. So to the extent that we can be helpful, you know, that's what, you know, when I started Squeegee Corps this summer, what I said is that we've got to get these young people off the street. I'll be meeting with the Squeegee Corps board um, this week. I think it's before the end of this month to talk about how we enhance this effort. My goal was to get 100 young people off of the streets every um, every year. And so this wasn't something new. This is something we do all the time. Yeah. Are you, go ahead. When he was MLK, was he just sitting there? Or was yeah, he was sitting on the corner. When I saw him uh, at 9.30 p.m. at night, he was sitting on the corner eating a biscuit. And uh, when I, uh, yeah, when I encountered him the next day, he was sharing a donut, a donut with his mother. Thank you, everybody. Do you have any update on the um, uh, audit for uh, police over time? No, not yet, but we'll bring it to you. Thank you.